Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Teitelbaum from Lidos Biomedical Research. I'll be presenting an overview of protocol design and logistics, the keys for the new investigator. Just so everyone knows that this is a presentation based on my own personal experience and for certain anyone who is going to be undertaking uh, clinical research, particularly in the beginning, should be consulting all appropriate references. I don't have any conflicts to disclose. As far as my background, uh, I currently work as a medical monitor um, in NIAD. I've also been an IRB member and protocol reviewer for about 20 years now. Uh, I've written a number of protocols and uh, many more portions of protocols. Uh, and I have uh, functioned as a research uh, site monitor and as an auditor, so I have certainly seen some of the issues that people run into when they're implementing a protocol. So why do protocols matter? The protocol is the primary basis for everyone who is going to decide whether or not the research moves forward um, and whether that protocol gets funded. The protocol is essentially true north when references are required as to what was intended. The first place everyone will look is going to be that document. So to start with, I'm going to tell you, being a safety person, all the things that can go terribly wrong doing research and then hopefully arm you with ways to avoid those problems. Aware of these terms, uh, you can look into them in greater detail. You should not let them paralyze you, but there are things that uh, you have to consider when you are doing clinical research. Protocol deviations are a change or divergence or departure from the protocol as it was approved for research by the IRB. Those can be divided into major and minor deviations, and the major deviations are the ones that generally uh, are involving safety of subjects uh, or the integrity of the data, and therefore the entire study. Uh, there is a concept of noncompliance, which is pretty much what it sounds like. You have a protocol, you're supposed to follow the protocol, but for some reason, don't. And if you do it willfully, and if you do it repeatedly, uh, you can get into significant problems and you can be sanctioned from doing research. Again, the noncompliance is divided into uh, serious noncompliance and also continuing noncompliance, and they are pretty much as they sound. There's also a concept that is extremely complicated. I will not for sure be able to completely explain it today. You should be aware of it and you could look into it further and it will probably be defined in many, if not all, protocols that you would read. It's called the unanticipated problem, which is a very sort of vague sounding catch bucket. It is uh, a situation where there is an incident, experience, or an outcome that is unexpected. No one saw it coming. Uh, in terms of the nature of the event, the severity of the event, or how often it's happening, based upon what people know as far as the procedures that are described in the protocol, and in particular the informed consent, which is what the subjects will have seen and signed, and also the characteristics of the population you're doing the research on. It has to be related to the research. It can't be something that has nothing to do with your research that you get into if you will, difficulties or trouble from. And it has to suggest that the research is placing people at greater harm than was previously recognized. It's very important to realize that unanticipated problems are an IRB-oriented concept. If what you're doing or the problem you've run into is something that would surprise your IRB, your ethics review board, overseeing your research, it may well be an unanticipated problem and it will need to be reported as such. I provide a, an example here on this slide of some of the things that can go wrong. Uh, you can imagine the second and third bullets here. Um, you give someone a vaccine virus, a uh, live virus, 
and uh, that virus continues to shed longer than you would have anticipated. And then the third bullet, you have that same person who's been exposed to that virus potentially decide, hey, I'm done with this and I'm going to leave the isolation unit and go out there while I'm still shedding an investigational vaccine virus. That's a problem. Generally, an unanticipated problem is going to require uh, changes to the protocol or the informed consent or your manual of procedures for the study. In other words, it's going to require you change the way you're doing things in the study, and it's going to, going to require the documents that define how you do things in the study. Generally, that's a good test of whether something, something is an unanticipated problem. In terms of writing a clinical protocol, there are many contributors. There are scientific contributors who've done the work to develop whatever product or device you're testing. There are, there are the clinicians who have access to the population, the patients. Uh, there are the people who are putting up the money, manufacturers of the drug or the device, uh, people who hold a patent, um, or uh, people who are responsible to regulators in terms of an IND or an IDE. And if you don't know those terms, you can certainly look them up. Them up. Uh, people who are responsible for the safety of the study, particularly the safety of your subjects, who are going to monitor it, who are going to make sure that you comply with regulatory requirements, uh, overseers like a DSMB or an IRB, nurses and coordinators, and of course the writers who actually put pen to paper or if you will, hit the, hit the keys. In terms of preparation and approach, you should, if you are new to this business, read similar protocols. There are protocols posted online and you can certainly get protocols, especially in your field of interest, from colleagues. Plan ahead. Try to plot the most direct, most feasible, most humane in terms of your subject's path to the data you need. You start with the question and the data you need, the very most direct path to getting that data. Avoid nice-to-have items, uh, particularly in the beginning. Those things can become much more trouble than they're worth. Start with a hypothesis. All of us who are in clinical research understand what a hypothesis is. We've learned it in second or third grade, perhaps. And that, that will drive your objectives. Your objectives will then drive your endpoints and thus the study procedures. There are two models in terms of clinical research. You can have one person who is acting as the writer and essentially the owner of the, of the document, and all work flows through that individual, and that individual maintains the official copy and will reach out to collaborators as needed. Or you can have a peer group that circulates uh, a live document from one to the next in some, some decided fashion. I can just suggest that if you're using the peer model, people have to be really clear on who's got the live document at any given moment so there's no confusion or problems with version control. Protocol lead to a lot of issues in actually trying to get the work approved, funded, or carried out. Um, they can confuse the people you need to understand the work. There can be operational errors once you've started, which can be honestly devastating, if not crippling, and in fact, obviously dangerous. Uh, there can be concerns about the safety or the integrity of your data, even once you've completed the research, if it's not planned well and executed well. A lot of emails, pauses, holes, and meetings and these things can be costly and very time consuming to fix. So my best advice, be practical. Uh, focus on, on how you need to do things most efficiently and most effectively. This may not always be perfect. It, it may not be precisely the research the way you would do it if you had complete control of everything. You're, you're collaborating by definition you're using human subjects, and you need to uh, fit into the way that things are done and the way that other people who
who have experience and uh, are important to your project are going to want. So even the very best of work, and I can assure you this after 20 years of doing it, always represents a compromise. It is not the way any one individual, the principal investigator, the sponsor, uh, even the FDA who has regulatory authority or the IRB would like the research to be done, but it's, it's the best possible compromise where everyone feels it's acceptable. Acceptability is a pretty good thing. The protocol is a rule book. It is the rule book when you're doing your research. It will, it will define success versus failure. It will tie your hypothesis to your endpoints and your statistics, which will measure whether you succeeded or failed, whether you have a positive or negative study. It will define safety and stopping, extremely, extremely important. The most important thing in human subjects research is making sure your subjects are as well protected and as, and as safe as possible and that there are no unnecessary or inappropriate or undisclosed risks. And it will interventions you can take if you need to, for example, modify a dose of a drug or um, deal with a, a malfunction of a device. You need to be clear. Uh, I cannot emphasize that, that enough. Uh, there is a bit of a curse of knowledge, which is the fact that you know the work so well, it is so ingrained in your head, you can picture what you want, but it's not being communicated clearly or well. You're competing for limited resources, and I've listed here some of those limited resources, and so you have to basically sell your concept, your protocol, as being feasible and worth doing. Always pay attention to version control uh, with a main number and a decimal number, generally speaking, a date, of course, and sometimes you may, and sometimes you may have multiple revisions within even one day. If you have multiple collaborators, you need to track those things. And once you have gone through regulatory or IRB review, you should start to keep a summary of the changes from one version to the, to the next and be able to do a track change copy so that reviewers don't have to reread things that haven't changed since you're reviewed and approved. That's very important. There are three kinds of protocols I think uh, generally have problems. The first is uh, a protocol that's just not a good idea. It's just not good science, but it's very, very well written. So that bad idea is not going to get very far because if that bad idea is, is, is well and accurately described in the protocol, people will spot the problems right away and it will not move forward. The second type is the type that will probably be most disappointing to uh, you as a new investigator. That is you have a really good idea. You do have truly valid and important research and you, you are not effective in communicating it to the people who have to review it and approve it. And this is going to lead to confusion, as I stated earlier, and you're probably going to get disapproved. Uh, what I would say is don't be discouraged. Uh, all feedback should be given positively. Ideally, more experienced people will step in and reviewers who step in and point you back in the right direction tell you you need to really clarify this section or that, and that will get you back on track. So don't give up. Those are really bad idea with bad science. That's also really confusingly communicated. These are the types of protocols that are nightmares to reviewers and regulators because they can be so confusing as to be misleading and to actually sneak through the safeguards in the system. And if people have any doubts about a protocol, they're going to kick it back and just say you have to be clearer so that we know, know if it's a good idea or a bad one. We'll go through the sections of the protocol in terms of pitfalls and suggestions. The objectives section uh, should really start with a hypothesis. If you don't have a hypothesis, you may find yourself wandering. Uh, you need to have a design that goes back to your objective. 
and you should not and you should not be overly ambitious in what you're trying to accomplish given the phase of development of the drug or the, the device or the, thing, or the number of people you expect to be able to reasonably uh, enroll. In the background section, be careful about cutting and pasting. That is notorious as a problem in this section. Um, you should not have really important, you should not have really important details about how to do the research in the background section. It is by definition background. It is a section that people who are familiar with the population or the disease could potentially skim over or even skip. They shouldn't miss key details. They should be elsewhere. Uh, and don't go into unnecessary detail or commit to hard statistics that are true today but may be inaccurate in six months because that'll make the protocol look dated. Every inclusion exclusion parameter you pick needs to have a reason and those reasons and those uh, boundaries that you place, whether they're five times the upper limit of normal for a liver function test or twice, um, two points off of normal for a hemoglobin, those things need to be carefully thought out. Uh, they will tend to limit the number of people you convert people you search. In terms of selection and enrollment, be careful to make symbols greater than, less than, equal to. Uh, they need to be mutually exclusive. Uh, think about who can, can obtain or provide or sign for consent, if, especially if you're approaching a pediatric population or a population uh, that is not uh, legally um, appropriate to be signing consent consent for their own research because of um, um, uh, mental capacity uh, questions. In other words, if you're doing research on a population that by definition really does not have legal uh, uh, authority to sign for themselves, that is important. Who's going to sign for them? Uh, that gets into the topic of le uh, legally, uh, legally authorized representatives or LARs, which you can become familiar with. Think about your entry criteria versus continu continuation criteria. Who's going to do the screening? Uh, just pay attention to that section. Pay close attention to schedules and windows for consent. Consent does not equal screening, does not equal enrollment. Each of these terms has specific meanings, but different people think they mean different things. Some of these periods in the research endeavor, especially in the beginning, can overlap. Obviously, consent can happen after screening. Randomization generally can uh, happen after enrollment, but they can happen at the same time. So pay attention to these windows. Pay attention to the pharma and regulatory section. Be consistent from the investigator's brochure for the drug you're investigating to make sure you're accurate, you're accurate in presenting uh, the pharmacology of it. Uh, try and anticipate who's going to be focused on each of the, your uh, protocol sections and write to them and for them in a clear way, in a way that they'll understand. Make it clear what regulatory platform, uh, which is, for example, the IND from the US FDA or the IDE for a device study from the US FDA, et cetera, make clear what regulatory platform your research will be uh, proceeding under. I like, to, I like to call these the seven C's um, of research try and make the work compelling. Again, you're competing for something, whether it's a subject population, whether it's drug that's going to be supplied by a manufacturer, et cetera. Um, make a good case for doing your research. Why does it matter? Uh, this matters in terms of hypothesis. Use the objective section and make sure your procedures are practical and address your endpoints. Be consistent. It is um, extremely distracting and pot potentially will significantly delay your research if you have inconsistencies from one section of a protocol to another sec section within the same document, or if you're inconsistent between the protocol, let's say, and the investigator's brochure for the drug that you're going to be using. 
consistency is incredibly important. One of the common areas is you will have a chart or a graph that is essentially a calendar of all the events in your research, and then you'll have a description in words of what's going to happen at each visit. Make sure they match up. Be clear. This would be a plea from me as somebody and from anyone probably in that situation. Be crystal clear. Use short, clear sentences. Um, I would say speak like a cab driver and not like a pro professor of British literature. Uh, be very direct. Hemingway comes to mind. Um, again, make clear what is happening to each subject at each point in the research. You should, if you start out with 50 people and you divide them into groups of 10 and you have five groups, and you carry through your research procedures and what's going to happen to each of those five groups, be sure you account for all 50 of them. Don't, don't forget about 10 of them. That will stand out. If there are important ev evaluations that will lead to your key data points, the protocol should specify the qualifications of the people making those determ determinations. Uh, you should try and strive for objectivity wherever you can over subjectivity. Um, experience where people are going to be making uh, an informed guess or forming an opinion as opposed to collecting objective data. Be complete. Make sure that the protocol stands on its own, that you're not referring to all kinds of other documents or appendices uh, for very important pieces of information. Obviously, be correct. Uh, the protocol will be reviewed by some lay people. It will be reviewed by some people with more of a regulatory uh, background or a human subjects or ethical background, but it will also be reviewed by peers and by experts uh, who will have to pass on it. The FDA has experts in every single area you could possibly imagine and sub area and population if there are things that you're putting forward in the protocol that are just not accurate or not current, it's going to show up. Be compassionate, uh, not in the sense of uh, letting your heart bleed over this, but in the sense of remembering that these are not guinea pigs that you're doing research on or amoebas. These are human subjects and you want to encourage these volunteers to participate you want to ask of them reasonable things and avoid asking unreasonable things. Uh, there is sacrifice involved in participating as a research participant, but it should not be unreasonable. Make the protocol consentable. That is, uh, make it easy for the subject to understand the consent document, to understand what you're proposing, and Consider it a contract. Don't write it like a contract, like a contract. That is unfortunately a problem we run into these days uh, in research where informed consent documents really do look like a, like a legal contract. But you should treat it as if you're making a contract or entering into an agreement with your subject. Treat them with respect. Be clear. Tell them this is what we're asking you to do and this is what we're going to do to you and this is how we're going to keep you safe and these are the risks. Once you're all done, do something old fashioned. Print the protocol out, sacrifice 50 or 100 or even 150 pages of paper. It will be worth it uh, rather than on a screen. Staple it together, uh, clip it together, whatever you like, and go through it with a uh, pencil and a good reading light page by page from beginning to end. That is extremely helpful in spotting inconsistencies and have others whom you respect review it for you as well. There's a point at which all of us know we can no longer spot issues or problems in our own writing. Uh, so have others who you trust review it and review it as a document, not just as a research protocol, but as a document. Does it hold together? Does it have a beginning, a middle, and an end? So you need to keep the real world in mind as you 
plan this major endeavor. A bit like writing uh, a movie script. Before the shooting begins, it's great. The script is brilliant. And then the real world sets in. You can imagine Hollywood or wherever, Vancouver, personalities, egos, directors, bad weather, bad lighting, etc. Things will go wrong. But you try to write the best story, the best script, the best plan for that movie, hence uh, the best protocol for the research that you can in the beginning, and stick to it, adjust as you need to, and you'll hopefully succeed. Best of luck.